Here in Northern California, the wintertime brings us an opportunity to go and find and photograph sandhill cranes. They migrate through here from November through about March. The sandhill crane is on the endangered species list due mostly to habitat loss. And this bird is one of the oldest living species on the planet because they found fossils dating back some 10 million years. So I try to get out every year and photograph them if I can. They make a very distinctive sound early in the morning, so I also had to make some sound recordings while I was out there. I brought out my parabolic microphone and was able to get some pretty good sound this time around. Check it out. This year I went with my friend Dale and I was not only able to grab some photographs, but I also discovered a trick with my camera to allow me to make captures early in the morning and late in the evening when there's just very little light. I'll show you what I did coming up. Hi, I'm Terry Vanderhein, full-time professional photographer. The sandhill cranes make great subject matter for photograph, partly because they're large and they don't move around quite so fast. Since the bird is large and moves slow, this makes it not only easier to track in the viewfinder, but you also don't have to use as high a shutter speed when you are trying to photograph them as you would like a quicker, smaller bird. So smaller birds for me are, are shot at one thirty-two hundredth of a second and even higher to get that razor sharp image that's so important to me. When I'm photographing large birds that tend to kind of lumber along, I can get away with shooting them sometimes at a one one thousandth of a second or so. Now these cranes are a bit skittish, so I'd suggest you bring your longest lens you have for this kind of photography. That way you can stay as far away from them as possible. I used my 600 f4, and in some cases, I put on the teleconverter to make an 840 millimeter f5.6 lens. The crane's behavior is this. At night, they gather in flocks on these little islands and sandbars and to help protect themselves from predators. If they can find some land that's protected by water on all sides, then they're pretty happy to rest comfortably through the night. In the morning, just like us, they go out and get ready to find some breakfast. They normally feed on grain and grasses, but they won't pass up small mammals or amphibians or reptiles. So once the sun comes up, they're soon getting ready to take off and feed elsewhere from where they sleep. So you have to be ready. Here, Dale and I talk a little bit about our excursion. Absolutely. So we started early this morning and we were out looking for sandhill cranes. And we've been up here before looking for sandhill cranes. And uh, in this particular case, we were able to find some and uh, we got some pretty good shots. But we got a bonus today, which I wasn't expecting. We were uh, traveling along and we saw some snow geese, uh, <laughs> you know, probably about 50 or so in a field. We thought, well, let's. And as we stopped, we could see several of them circling above. And what would you say by the time we left? What kind of number? Oh, uh, there was thousands. Thousands. So we went yeah. from a few hundred to thousands in a few minutes of sitting there watching and photographing. And I found for myself, when it's too low of light, what I've started doing is I shoot some video because video is shot at you know a sixtieth of a second. Oh, that's and a great idea, yeah. Now you can shoot in the super early morning and I shoot video at first and then, then I can shoot the stills once I get enough light that 6400 is my max and I, and I can get enough speed. I don't want to shoot flying birds at 125th of a second. Right. You know, I mean, you can if you're panning and you get lucky, but for the most part, I want to have something where I can 
shoot and get a good quality of image. So I'm going to shoot, you know, where I can stop those wings. And yeah. Sharp. Yep. My 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 whole idea when I'm out shooting is to have that razor sharp image where I can share it and have the ability for people to look at it and say, wow, okay, that looks great. So I'm the same. I'm the same. There's a lot of things I'll, I'll give up and say, okay, I'll compromise. But that sharpness and the detail is, uh, is what I'm always personally yeah. aiming. For me, I found that shooting video early in the morning gives me the opportunity to capture wildlife even when the light is really low. Let me show you my setup for shooting video with the Nikon Z9. This week's video is sponsored by you, the viewer. Subscribing to my channel and purchasing my products from my website allows me to continue making content like this, so I really appreciate it. My website is imagelight.com. On my digital products page of my site, you can find my ebook, Razor Sharp Nature Photography. This ebook is all about getting the sharpest images possible. Razor Sharp covers all aspects of getting those images that really stand out. This ebook is only available on my website, imagelight.com, so go to the digital products page and pick up your copy today. I'll leave a link in the description below. When considering shooting video and with the Nikon Z9, or any other camera for that matter, you have to have a sturdy tripod. If you're shooting on a long lens, the best practices I use are to set up and start recording and take my hands completely off the camera entirely. Just the slightest touch can cause a vibration that'll move through the entire image. The longer the lens, the more sensitive this vibration can be, so be careful. Any panning you do should be done in post, unless you're using a video tripod. When you're shooting video, you have to set your camera on how many frames per second you want to shoot in. On the Z9, which has terrific video capabilities, I go into the menu and scroll to the left until I get to the little video camera. Scroll down to the video file type. Over to the right again, you'll see a list of video file types. From the top down, you'll see N raw 12-bit, that's the Nikon 12-bit processing. Next is ProRes RAW 12, and then there's ProRes 442 10-bit, and then H.265 10-bit, and then finally 8-bit movie file and 8-bit MP4s. Choosing the file type's up to you, but suffice it to say, the first two, NRAW and ProRes RAW, will create large video files that give you all kinds of latitude when you're editing the videos. Fixing the highlights and the shadows is, is just a breeze, just like you have the ability with RAW images versus JPEG files. While this is nice, you may not want to get into all this right away. The files are very large, and they eat up a ton of space on your memory cards. Also, these files require some work and color grading before you can start showing them to anybody. So it's, there's a fair amount of work you can have to do into these things before you even start. The next one, H.265 10-bit, strikes a pretty good balance, and it's a pretty nice video file. Most of the times, it can be shared right out of the camera. It has good color depth and reasonably sized files. This is the file format that I use most of the time. The next two are 8-bit files, and while they're easy to work with and they take up a lot less memory on your cards, I don't think the clips look as nice as the 10-bit file. With each file type, they have different frame rates and sizes. Most people should be working in 4K, which is written at 3840 by 2160. That's the amount of pixels that that frame uses. 4K allows some freedom in cropping in the final clip, which is a nice asset to have. The video size format lets you shoot in 4K all the way up to 120 frames per second in case you want to do something in slow motion. Now, if you think you might want to crop a lot, the Z9 offers 8K video up to 30 frames a second. Now, a little bit about uh, frame rate. Most videos and movies that you see in the theater, rather, are 24 frames per second. It's the most pleasing rate of images going by for the human eye. Now, if you want really crisp video, like they have in sports or like in wildlife that you see on television, these are shot at least at 30 frames a second. So if you're looking for something that you might intend to slow down into slow motion, and, your and if your camera's capable of it, shoot at more frames per second, like 60 frames per second or 120 frames per second. 
you can even go higher in some cameras cases. For this particular simple configuration, let's use 30 frames per second. If you choose this frame rate, then your shutter speed can be no higher than 1 1 60th of a second. The rule in filmmaking is that double your frame rate for your shutter speed. This will give you enough motion to view the video with some fluidity. The action will be smooth on the screen. If you shoot too high of a shutter speed, the action can look kind of choppy. This is a technique that some cinematographers use uh, to give a kind of a frantic look. But for the most part, we're gonna be shooting wildlife. So let's stick with 1 60th of a second for your shutter speed. Now here's how all this pays off. If you were shooting stills and wanted to get some action stopped, let's say you're shooting at 1 2,000th of a second. However, because the light's so low and the conditions are such that you don't have enough light, you have to bump your ISO up to say 12,800 to get a good exposure. Now this kind of an image can be pretty noisy and need a fair amount of work at denoising in the final image and probably still won't measure up to some of your other shots. If you flip over to video at this time of day, you now know that you can shoot no higher of a shutter speed than 1 60th of a second. So your ISO drops down to say a beautiful 400 ISO. Now I understand that shooting video is a whole thing and not everyone wants to undertake it. But if you want to, give it a try. It's a great way to capture wildlife at the times of day where you'd just be sitting and watching because the light is just too low. I can post more info about shooting video here on this channel if you like, so just let me know in your comments. While you're there, if you can, give this video a thumbs up and then subscribe to my channel and make sure to hit the notify bell to be notified of my next video. I really appreciate the support for my videos for everyone who's subscribed already. Thanks again. Until next time, this is Terry Vanderheiden.